Alexander Henry Rind was born on 26 July 1833, the younger son of Josiah Rind, a banker in Wick, and his wife, Henrietta Sinclair. He studied at Pulteney Academy and on leaving school was accepted at the University of Edinburgh where he studied natural history and natural philosophy. In March 1851, Henry, as he preferred to be called, returned to his native Caithness and did work at the Cairns of Yarrows to the south of Wick. Later that year, he attended the Great Exhibition in London before setting off for Europe, visiting the museums of Switzerland, Austria, Italy and Denmark. On his return, he began to correspond with John Stuart, who later became secretary of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland. In early 1852, he sent a rubbing to Stuart of a stone slab at Ulbster. It took Rind a couple of days to scrape away the mosses and vegetation which covered it, but he was determined to send it. Stuart was delighted with the rubbing, and so began an enduring friendship between the two men. By the end of the year, Rind had been elected a Fellow of the Society and began delivering papers to it. In 1853, the year his father bought the estate of Sipster, Rin began work on the remains of a Pictish house, or Broch, at Kettleburn, near Wick. Today, nothing remains of it, but when he came across it, his team managed to excavate it, and they collected a range of artefacts, although he regretted that the ruins were not in the most perfect condition. By the end of that year, Rind began to realise his health was deteriorating. He had been keen on walking, shooting and boating, but he found even walking up the slightest incline was becoming difficult, especially in cold weather. He came to realise that he would have to spend the winters away from his native Caithness in a warmer climate. During the winter of 53-54, he received news that his older brother, Josiah, had died. It was also during that winter that he decided not to continue studying law. He was simply too ill. Instead, he spent his time writing about the antiquities that he'd come to love. During a spell at Ventnor, a Victorian health resort on the Isle of Wight the following winter, he wrote about bronze swords occasionally attributed to the Romans, which he sent to his friend, Stuart. For the winter of 1855-56, Rind made the journey to Egypt, which became a life-changing decision. The warmer climate suited him well, and he became interested in the culture and ancient antiquities of the country. He began to research the tombs at Thebes and found many interesting and rare artefacts, including a set of bilingual papyri, which later became known as the Rind Papyrus. In a letter to Stuart, he explained how he wished to add Egyptian antiquities to the British Museums because these extraordinary people were so near to the beginning of civilization, and to use their work to compare it to other civilizations. By November 1856, he had completed a small book entitled Egypt, Its Climate, Character and Resources as a Winter Resort. Rind returned to Sibster for some of the summer months, and he again spent time out and about on trips, excavating various places when his health allowed. Among the excavations he undertook were the tumuli on the Sibster estate, which he later wrote a paper on and delivered to the Society of Antiquaries. In July, he travelled down to Edinburgh to attend a meeting of the Archaeological Institute we read a paper on the megalithic remains of Malta 
to the assembled company. It was during this meeting that he also read on the history of systematic classification of primeval relics, in which he pointed out that the Scots had been the ones to classify ancient relics in fixed progressive periods long before archaeologists had done so in the Scandinavian countries. A few months later, he was back in Egypt for the winter. He simply took up from where he'd left off at the tombs at Thebes. However, this time he'd been granted permission by the British authorities to excavate wherever he pleased. But he was not a man to abuse this privilege. In a letter to Dr Davis, dated 9th January 1857, he explained that the governors had also said to him that all he need do was ask, and whatever he needed would be provided. On 8th January, his team found eight mummy cases, and the day he wrote the letter, another six had been found. The following Monday, according to the letter, he and his men were to head out to the Valley of the Splendid Tombs of the Kings. Added to this, about 150 miles up the river from where he was working, Lord Henry Scott and his team had begun excavating on the island of Elephantine, and he promised to send for Rind should they find anything of interest. However, all this work took its toll on Rind's health. He had to give up on the idea of a series of investigations in the Western Valley, as it would have meant a long day travelling on horseback daily, and he was just not well enough to do it. Instead, he did work near to his base, near Thebes, and he was rewarded by finding a remarkable tomb, which had been untouched. In early April, he left Egypt for Malta before setting off for home, back in Scotland. Again, the summer was spent at Sibster. Then he stayed in Edinburgh for a time, but whilst there, became ill. He had been on his way to church when he suddenly felt blood flow into his chest and began coughing it up. He spent weeks in bed before being able to travel to Malaga to recuperate. Here he spent time working on a pamphlet on the law of the treasure trove. How can it be best adapted to accomplish useful results? In this pamphlet, he described how the law currently worked and how some discovered treasure was being disposed of rather than being kept or was being concealed if it was of any significant value. When an artefact was found, it was meant to be reported to the local procurator fiscal, who acted on behalf of the Crown, but much of what was reported was not always preserved. However, he advocated a system that was followed in Denmark, which gathered all its antiquities in one national store, and in order to stop people throwing away any fines, he suggested that by allowing the finder to be paid the value of the object, then more items could be preserved for the nation. On St Andrew's Day, he was elected an honorary member of the Society at its anniversary meeting. While in Malaga in February 1858, Rind received news of his father's death. He was the last surviving member of the family. He then left Malaga and headed to Algiers. He stayed there until the beginning of May, as it was too lively for him to stay any longer, and moved to Avignon in the south of France, before heading to Sibster once more for part of the summer and autumn. Even on home ground he kept working and corresponded with those who had questions for him. By late October, he was back in the south of France, where he intended to stay until January, when he would either move down the Spanish coast or go to Italy. This year also saw the publication of his work, British Archaeology, 
its progress and demands. In this book, he took a swipe at the establishment in their treatment of archaeological finds. He wrote, It would appear that the sole cause why British remains are so entirely overlooked is to be sought in the inadequate perception of their value and interest by the trustees, or rather by those of them who attend the meetings and transact the business. What he advocated was the British Museum having a department for British antiquity, with a view to Scotland and Ireland having the same. He appealed to landowners to allow excavations and to preserve the past by ensuring the preservation of the remains by bailiffs, gamekeepers and ground officers. In this way, archaeological finds would be saved. By March 1859, Rind was in Rome, where he marvelled at the ancient Roman remains, both there and at Naples. Ancient Rome provided him with a myriad of ruins which he examined over the course of a week, and he decided to devote most of his time in the city. However, as always, he overextended himself and retreated to Capri to recuperate, but had to leave the island due to hostilities which had broken out. He returned to Clifton. During this time, he took an active role in helping the National Museum of Scotland to proceed with its classification of archaeological finds. Having visited many of the finest museums in Europe and noting their displays, he wrote his Memorandum on the Arrangement of the National Museum of Scottish Antiquities, in which he outlined how the displays should fall naturally with the relics. He wrote the collection should be arranged with respect to its instructive capabilities and not merely in a manner most convenient for generic adjustments or reference. And the collection should not as far as possible be classified to any conclusion that may be doubtful, instead of being allowed to evolve whatever shades of meaning they may bear. Over the coming months, he corresponded with the keeper of the museum, Mr. McCulloch, but as he was unable to visit the museum in person, the difficulty arose that he couldn't see how the displays were being mounted, so asked Stuart to look in and keep an eye on things. Towards the end of the year, illness once again took hold. A severe cold laid him low, which he'd caught on a boat as he made his way to France for the winter. And just as he recovered, his heart complaint returned, causing him to be bedridden for over a month. Over the next few months, he spent time in France, where he continued writing. As usual in the spring, he made the journey back to his rented home, Down House, near Bristol. He stopped at various places in France before reaching England in early June. It was during this time at home he began to work on his book on Thebes, for his health was good, even though the weather was unseasonably wet, and he managed to catch up with friends. In October, he and his friend Mr Palmer headed off to Madeira, where they began excavating on 1st January 1861. Rind continued to work on his book while out there. When the two returned to England in May, the book was complete and ready to be published. However, tragedy struck once more. In September, Palmer was visiting him when he suddenly took ill and died. The winter months were spent in Madeira, where he stayed and worked on the final edition of his book, Thebes, Its Tombs and Their Tenants, which was finally published in 1862. He hoped, at the very least, it would meet with some degree of success, as he'd worked on it so hard and for so long. 
He included chapters on the general history of Thebes, the tomb of the Theban noble, whose tomb had not been ransacked, and the finds he made there, notes on the excavations of the tomb of the kings, a chapter on the necropolis, and one on the ancient use of metallurgy. In the spring of 1862, Rin spent time in Tenerife, where he found the climate favourable, and he hoped to revisit the island the following year, and Gibraltar, following a small stint in the Canary Islands and Morocco, before returning to his Bristol home. He decided that for the coming winter he would return to Egypt, where he would spend time investigating and observing the River Nile and its deposits. He left England on a steamer on 4th October, bound for the Nile. He travelled a thousand miles and had decided to write another book, but the work again took its toll. While healthy, he made notes on the operations of the river and the growth of the alluvian, with reference to monuments. He measured the depth of the water, the rate of the current, and took samples of the sediment. However, when he reached Cairo, he was prostrated by a sharp attack of hemorrhage of the lung. But the heat of Egypt didn't help matters, and although still very ill, he made the journey to Corfu. But that didn't suit him, so he set off for Lake Como in Italy. He stayed at Lake Como until he felt well enough to begin journeying again, but knew he would have to break it up into small sections if he was to make it back to England. At the end of June, he made the four-day journey to Zurich in Switzerland, even though he was not fully recovered. This would be the place where he would die, aged 29. On 2nd July, Rind had gone out for a drive, but the weather was too hot for him, and he was exhausted by the time he arrived back at the place where he was staying. He complained of being worn out and decided to go to bed. His servant, James Fisher, checked on him several times, but in the morning when his master had still not moved from his sleeping position, Fisher found he'd died in his sleep. Henry's body was brought back from Switzerland to Wick, where he was buried on 13th July. Over his lifetime, Rind had amassed a huge library of 1,600 books, which he left to the Society of Antiquaries. He also bequeathed £400 for archaeological excavations to take place in the northeastern portion of Scotland, especially, but not exclusively, Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, and left an endowment for an institution at Wick for the industrial training of young orphan girls from some of the Caithness parishes. He left the copyright of his seminal work on Thebes to the Society and bequeathed the profits to them. He also wanted two scholarships funded at the University of Edinburgh, for which he left the sum of £5,000 and left the residue of the Sibster estate for the endowment of a professor or lecturer on archaeology in connection with the society. However, the money from the estate would not be freed up until Mr Bremner, who had a lifelong rent at Sibster, passed away. Rin's memory would also be continued thanks to a purchase he made in Luxor in Egypt. In 1858, he bought a papyrus scroll which had been found at the tomb in Thebes, and thanks to this single act, history enshrined his name on that scroll. It is widely known as the Rind Papyrus, and measures 18 feet long by just over a foot wide. The scroll explains that the scribe Ames was writing it in around 1600 BC, but that he had copied some of it from an even earlier time. The scroll is a mathematical treatise which included calculations for accounting, building and surveying, 
as well as some 87 mathematical problems, including the volume of cylinders and areas of circles. At the same market, Rind also acquired what became known as the leather roll. This too was a mathematical treatise and predates the Rind papyrus by around 200 years, as it was thought to have been written during the Egyptian Middle Kingdom. It was not unrolled until 1927 when it was discovered it consisted of 26 listed rational numbers, followed by the equivalent Egyptian fraction for each of the rational numbers. Both of these were much more advanced than had previously been thought. Money from his estate was made available for a volume containing a facsimile of these two bilingual papyri, and this it was later published as facsimiles of two papyri found in a tomb at Thebes. A final lasting legacy of Alexander Henry Rind is the prestigious Rind Lectures, which take place annually. They began in 1874 and consist of a series of six lectures, usually presented by a single academic over a weekend. The first lecture was given by Arthur Mitchell and was called The Past in the Present. <laughs> 